Hello and welcome to the Oscars Almanac History of the Academy Awards. My name is Paul Hernandez. This is Autumn Gladding. Hello. And in this series, Autumn and I will delve into each year's Best Picture winner, exploring the cultural context of the time and examining society's impact on the film, and in some cases, vice versa. We begin our journey in the golden age of silent cinema with the 1929 Best Picture winner, Wings. Autumn, tell us a little bit about the film. Sure thing. Wings was released in 1927. It was a groundbreaking silent film directed by William A. Wellman, who was renowned for his stunning aerial battles, sequences, and heartfelt portrayal of friendship and sacrifice during World War I. It made history by winning the very first Academy Award for Best Picture at the inaugural Oscar ceremony in 1929. But mm -hmm. before we give you our personal thoughts on it, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what happens in this movie? Mm -hmm. And we have our, our definitely have our own thoughts on this. We have thoughts. Um, <laughs> so here's a brief synopsis about the film in case you haven't seen it yet, but you are planning to see it. And you have a little context behind what we're talking about for the rest of this program. So two young men, one rich, one middle class, who are in love with the same woman become fighter pilots in World War I. Before they go off to fight in the Great War, Jack Powell, played by Charles Buddy Rogers, and David Armstrong, played by Richard Arland, are rivals for the same girl, the ultra-socialite Sylvia Lewis, played by Joanna Ralston. Meanwhile, Jack's neighbor, the effervescent tomboy Mary Preston, played by the incredible Claire Bow, pines for him openly, though he's too infatuated with Sylvia to notice. Jack is under the impression that Sylvia desires him. But it's really David Jack. that her heart belongs to. Not a good time for Jax in the no. previous era no. of film. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Autumn, we'll just, you know, before we even get into, like, what we thought of the film, yes. without context for people watching this, yeah, give them your favorite quote. I, this movie was very quotable, by the way. <laughs> so the cool. dialect of the time. Stop and it was all... Apatow. <laughs> And the fact that it's a silent film, so it wasn't just people were saying it. They took the time to pick these pieces of dialogue yeah. and put them yeah. on the screen. Because there's a lot of dialogue that wasn't on the screen at all. Okay, my favorite was Sergeant in Mervale. Is that what uh, it was called? Yeah, the Sergeant in Mervale. Like, Mervale okay. was the name of where they were training. Got but it. It's okay, just got the it. Sergeant. I didn't know how it was pronounced. Okay, so the Sergeant, he says to the... Um, trainees to the to the grunts I, lo I love it i love it he says <clears throat> see if i can do it hey if you guys need kissing i'll kiss you with a gun butt <laughs> boom that's assault <laughs> it but is. you know what and it said so like that whole scene where i know mean, we'll get into it but like yeah. where they're training i mean yeah. that's really where i remember seeing the the, the best example of like the silent film era and how yeah. much body language played into this right when they're doing this thing like this thing is real people like yeah. they really did that um did. my quote is not necessarily as fun but it is very very interesting um and the the reason is because i feel <laughs> uh it's gary cooper who says this who is cadet white and he says mm -hmm luck or no luck when your time comes you're gonna get it and i feel th that that was such a bummer of a line not only for this program it, yeah i was gonna say it's a bummer time, right now for yeah. the time like in 1929 the facing the horrors of the great war it was, was just a, a line that was not said like you know things were kept light and airy right. and fun and that was just not that and this film was rife with yeah. tons of different things but and with when with they that, did have dramas at that time they were mm -hmm. mellow dramas they weren't oh yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they weren't it wasn't gray's anatomy like that's not what they <laughs> were doing wasn't. definitely not um yeah snow <laughs> patrol was not playing behind a lot of these quotes that's for sure um autumn so what what did you think of the film? Because we have a lot to get to in this. We've yeah. got a lot of cultural context behind this, the, what the industry, what was going on in the industry, and all some yeah. fun bits. So very briefly, Autumn, what did you think of the film sort of as a whole? I thought it was a little bit disjointed, a little bit uneven in mm. some certain things. Like Clara Bow, who was the it girl at the time, she was solid. 
I mean, I thought she did a solid performance and it was fine and she's adorable and charming. And I think she yep. delivered being an it girl. She delivered mm -hmm. that. Um, and then the, what's his name? Jack who played, I mean, Charles Buddy. Charles Buddy Jack. Rogers played Jack Powell. He, he was also fine. He portrayed yeah. the character just fine. I don't know that that character had all that much depth to begin with, but he portrayed it just fine. Um, Sylvia, she was fine. She she did mm -hmm. her part. Her part was very shallow. Her part was just she was the uh, socialite that they yeah. wanted, and they were you know. Yeah. The one that surprised me was David, played by Richard Arlen. His right. character was, I thought, the only character that wasn't necessarily a stereotype or a caricature. I felt that you know Mary was the girl next door, and Sylvie was the socialite. And we had Jack, who was like the naive dreamer who just wanted to fly and go off to the glory of war. And then David, who should have been, if he was equal to the rest of their characters, should have just been the dashing young rich man. Mm. Um, and that was all that. And he's in love with Sylvia yeah. and she's in <clears throat> love with that's him. That's how he's written as too. Yeah, like. and that's how he's written. And I, I feel that the actor, I feel that Richard Arlen himself brought more to that role because I don't feel that the writing was imbalanced. I feel that his acting was so much better and so much more nuanced than the rest of the characters Agreed. because he was very torn. Like he's the one, like in this movie, as we said, um, Sylvia really did love him, but she was so worried. She had kind of a gentle heart and she didn't want to, mm -hmm. she didn't want to break Jack's heart. Jack had this yeah, yeah. huge crush on her and Mary has this huge crush on Jack and Sylvia doesn't really care for Jack in that way. But she's, like I said, she's gentle, doesn't want to hurt his feelings. So she doesn't come out and tell the truth. So both mm -hmm. Jack and David go off to war, both believing that she is in love with him and only David is right. But David is also against stereotype very compassionate, mm -hmm. very empathetic, and he's very kind, and he does not want to hurt Jack. And they are rivals when they go. They're not friends when they go. They're rivals. Yeah. But nevertheless, Jack stays kind, and he, he has so much um, emotion in his performances that he's you really very see. Emotive. Yeah, yeah, you really, really see that struggle he has between mm -hmm you know, choking down the fact that he's in love with the person he's in love with, but also being kind to somebody who just keeps throwing in his face over and over again that Sylvia has chosen him when she there, hasn't. There is a scene very late in the movie. And again, um, if, you know, if this is the first episode you've ever watched, it's also the first episode ever uh, of the Oscar's uh, yeah. Almanac. This is a spoiler-free show. We're not going to spoil much of these movies, right. even though they've been out for maybe by the time we're done with this, 100 years. Um, yeah. But... It, you know, there is a moment where uh, Jack is looking at a picture of something and he has to confront David and there is just this wash over his face mm -hmm. of, of sadness, of acceptance, yeah. and all of that is done silently. Yes. And I'm like, damn, like there are some moments mm -hmm. throughout this autumn yeah. and I'm sure you can agree. And yeah. we can pinpoint so many of them, especially towards the end when a character yeah. visits another character's parent that like yeah. is just oh. Like, oh my goodness like yeah. they are acting their faces yeah. off i would say that richard allen left no crumbs <laughs> i don't uh yeah that dude ate that dude ate yeah and absolutely. there's no crumbs in his hair look how slick i look someone he... who also has like pretty tight hair like my hair is pretty yeah. tight it's not like that his is so Definitely shiny not. it is yeah. very shiny i like it, it. Really i is. dig his hair yeah, this is an interesting film. I think, Autumn, you encapsulated a lot of what I felt very similarly. Yeah. I thought that the movie, and again, if, if you are ever planning on watching it, um, it is it is a long film. It is like a two and a half hour film. It's a silent film, but it is so worth watching um, just yeah. to see how far Hollywood has come. I, some of the things that I felt were interesting is there really is a lack of an antagonist in this film. Um, the, the biggest antagonist is World War I. Like that's yeah. what is happening. That's the big looming thing yep. over it. There are really, there's something to be and said. The bad and guys, the others. Yeah. The others. Yeah. yeah. I think there's yeah. something to be said about this film that is interesting. Um, in 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 context with what we're watching now, is that like we need very like complex heroes and complex villains. And yeah. this time it's like every one of these characters is likable and marketable mm -hmm. because that's what they were. They were product mm -hmm. to these studios. And so they were all so likable. And 
it's a pretty interesting difference to what we have now. Yeah. I want to say, speaking of likable, I just want to give a shout out to my favorite oh, yes. supporting character. His This is Ed Brendel, and he mm -hmm. was playing a character called, I'm never going to get, Her Schwimpf. Herman, Sch Herman Schwimpf. 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 Who was a German-American. Yes. And he was the comic relief. He was in many scenes. He didn't have a fully fledged out plot line at all. He had no story yeah. arc. He was just comic relief here and there, which I think they thought the film needed, and maybe it did. Um, mm -hmm. The Sarge also gave some of that comic relief. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. do you want to explain to them what the best part of Schwimp the best, was? The best part of Herman Schwimp is when he <laughs> is signing up to go into the war. He's, uh, he's signing up for the draft line. And um, the sergeant, who is one of the, you know, the primary characters in the beginning, sort of yeah. like looks at him and he says, like, he sees it, the it, name. It, it brings up a box yeah. and it says Schwimpf. Yeah. And then he looks at him because it's a German American name and they're fighting the right. Germans in World War One, obviously. Right. So, there's, so there, it's contentious. And so he looks at him and pow, right on the kisser, gives him, <laughs> right one. On gives the him kisser. a good one. And Herman Schwimpf falls and somehow his. His shirt becomes he, undone. His like shirt comes rips. off and the sleeves are off like he's Mac from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And yes. he has an American tattoo flag here. And every single time they show it, they zoom in like real close, real close and they're moving his bicep. So it looks from like behind. the American but like, from behind. So it looks yes. like the American flag is, is just yeah. moving. And they love that joke so much. They do it at least two times, maybe a third. Yeah, at least twice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it lands every time. It landed for me. And they all go, oh, time. okay. Everyone immediately accepts it. And they help them up like. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, everyone thing, knows a spy could never go get a tattoo. Yeah, no. That, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> amazing that we won that war with Schwimp in the uh in the ranks Real. but yeah um yeah i i would say you know for as far as like fandom social goes i mean we did like this film it is a very it's a very complex film even though it's got <clears throat> some fluff built into it but it is sure. on purpose and there is so very much that it that is that makes up this film um yeah. that we will get into right after a quick break from our very First sponsor, Coca-Cola. <clears throat> okay, are we ready? Mm -hmm. Folks, this episode of the Oscars Almanac is brought to you by Coca-Cola, the perfect refreshment for any movie night. And guess what, Paul? They've made a thrilling new change to their recipe. Really? Do tell, Autumn. <clears throat> Well, Paul, in the spirit of moving forward and keeping up with the times, Coca-Cola has made a bold decision. They've officially removed cocaine from their formula. That's right. You can now enjoy your favorite fizzy drink with all the delicious taste, but without the uh, extra kick. Wow, that's quite the modern marvel. So you're saying I can sip on a Coke while watching Wings and stay right here in 1929 without making a unexpected flight of my own? <clears throat> Hold on. Keep it together. Exactly, Robert. Paul. Coca-Cola is all about that sweet, refreshing taste that brings people together. No time travel necessary. It's the perfect beverage for those long movie nights or when you're just looking to cool off after a hot day at the biplane races. Biplanes. I must say, Autumn, that sounds like a swell idea. A Coke in a movie sounds like the bee's knees to me. Cheers to Coca-Cola for keeping it refreshing and let's say more family friendly. <laughs> So, folks, next time you're reaching for a refreshing drink, make it a Coca-Cola. Delicious, invigorating, and now 100% cocaine-free. Because who needs the past when you've got the taste of the future right in your glass? Cheers to that, Autumn. And cheers to you, Coca-Cola, for sponsoring today's journey through cinema history. That was great. That's great. I hope they liked it. I hope they like that too. Yeah, we'll edit that. We'll edit this the the this part yeah. right. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, well, oh, I forgot to do my other part. Now back to the program. There you go. 
the program. <laughs> Everyone, uh, that's an actual ad from 1929. So it we sure to go, is. We wanted to go ahead and read that for you all. And don't worry. <laughs> to clarify, <laughs> the image was an actual ad. The dialogue. We may have had some we, fun. We took some liberties. <laughs> we took some liberties. Um, but yeah, back to the program here. Um, we're going to get a little bit into the industry context for this film. In the Roaring Twenties, Hollywood experienced a golden age of filmmaking. And Mark, I don't know why this is, I'm still holding this. <laughs> <laughs> it's and the vibe. Mark, it's the vibe, honestly. Uh, in the Roaring Twenties, Hollywood experienced a golden age of filmmaking, marked by the rise of iconic stars like Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford, and the establishment of major studios such as MGM and Warner Brothers. The era saw the birth of the modern film industry with silent films giving ways to talkies, revolutionizing entertainment and, sh and shaping pop culture worldwide mm -hmm. um, and shaping pop culture pretty much and everything that we do now. So, yeah, absolutely. Autumn, this is an interesting film. I mean, we got into a little bit of what we thought about it and a little tiny bit of context, but this film is so incredible for so many reasons. Oh, yeah. Do you want to share at least a little bit of what yeah. made this film, you know, pretty much in the Rushmore of yeah. these early films. Yeah, it definitely took it took cinema through some leaps and bounds. There were a lot of firsts that happened in this. There were a lot of you know giant leaps forward, and mm -hmm. some of them were in the technology, in the um, the aerial filming of this movie was one of the first times when they really got. They really took it to the next level. So yeah. they were actually pilots flying. There were actual pilots from the war who were flying yeah. and they mounted cameras onto mm -hmm. those planes. And they had, you know, real uh, pilots. William A. Wellman, the director, was yes. an ex fire, uh, an ex yes. uh, Air Force member in right. the Great War itself. Yeah. And so, he knew he all about stuff. the dogfights and the, the whole experience of that. And he really wanted to bring that dogfight experience and make it more visceral and make it more understandable to audiences like this yeah. is what this was like it's not just stories that they would hear but he really wanted to show people what it was and you can see it i mean it it, it was very realistic because it mm -hmm. was really happening i mean yeah it was, it was, real. I mean, it, it was i mean in these uh you know i'm gonna i'm gonna put actors in quotes but the only reason is because mm -hmm. the term you know calling these actors like <laughs> charles buddy rogers richard arland yeah um calling them just actors is very limiting because they had yeah. to be test pilots. They had to be actors, stunt people, camera mm -hmm. operators. There's even, yeah. um, if you don't mind me reading this, I found an excerpt um, sure. where one of the test pilots was talking, one of the people who worked on this, this is just passed down, obviously it's been years and years, was talking about in one particular scene, for example, Frank Clark, who was playing a German in the movie, uh, had was required to fly up 6,000 feet, switch on his camera, shudder as though he had just been hit by a bullet, open his mouth to release like fake blood, uh, which yeah. was chocolate syrup, by the way. Like this film did it years and years before Hitchcock did it, which I didn't know. I learned that in the research of this. But so the fake blood, he also had to deploy the prop that would make the plane look like it had just been hit. So that's like the smoke you're seeing. Oh yeah, the pff, as, yeah. as it's moving. It had to release the yoke and uh, steer the plane purposefully into a tailspin all the while still operating the camera continuously mm -hmm. spitting the blood and acting and acting and having to oh resist the gosh. temptation as an actual pilot to not correct the tailspin. Right. and that was That's one astounding. person that is frank clark and like when they talk about the innovations in aerial uh videography for this film like that's yeah. just one example because we could just yeah. do an entire show on how this show um, um, on how that movie yeah. completely reinvigorated and changed the perception yeah. of stunt work it raised the bar and it, yeah. it was also really dangerous i mean as you uh told me earlier today somebody actually died during the filming yeah. of this these aerial shots yeah there was two plane crashes one uh one pilot who was an actor so they, there were really, I mean, for the sake of this show, and we are not um, military historians, and we are not historians, so let's no. start there. Um, it, one pilot had actually, you know, there was a there was pilots and and military, and then there was actors 
who had to learn to become pilots. So right, there, so like three little, categories of yeah, three categories. participants. Yeah, and um, so there was a a an actor who had to learn how to be a military pilot. You know, just an actor uh, was an extra, but had crashed his plane and was hurt, but was otherwise alive. However, unfortunately, some of the more dangerous stunts were reserved for the actual military members. And unfortunately, one of the members of the Air Force did crash his plane and he did pass away. Um, but I mean, you know, not to sound too crass, but when they were doing these stunts, not saying that it's not now, but it's, you know, they're with, without being yeah. able to hide behind VFX, they were playing with, oh with live ammo. You know, and like, they, they, yeah, there were real exactly. explosions and mm -hmm. like they did not hold back. Like the director was all about authenticity and there were definitely higher stakes. And they, they unfortunately did, you know, incur some of the the risk that they were taking. It really yeah. but he was really just no holds barred. And like we said, he he raised the bar of what movies could do. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, Autumn, uh, of authenticity, there was another element of collaboration. This was mm -hmm. this was a film that was, you know, suited as you know, or it was it was sold. I could you know you can say as this military film, but it wasn't necessarily pro or anti military. No. It was just a film that involved the military. So yeah. a lot of people who were in more liberal anti war camps didn't know what to make of it. The people who were yeah. pro war didn't know what to make of it. So right. it actually lost funding originally, and it was short by I think. And, and someone in the comments can go out there and correct me. I think it was short about $10 million. Hmm. Um, so Wellman, the director, went to the military because he was ex-military. He still had right. contacts. And he got $14 million to help fund this film from the government. Wow. But it had to be uh, it, you know, a different shade of how yeah. they portrayed the military. But he right. got like $3,500 actual servicemen he got real planes he got real guns they were shooting real bullets um That's crazy it it is insane i mean we still see that sometimes like that happened in, in saving private ryan there was a little bit of a collaboration yeah. there were now uh military to cinema collaborators um in both hollywood and in our actual military but not like that do you think this is the first time that this happened? Do you think he broke ground on that kind of collaboration? Or do you think it happened before? I don't, we don't really know. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't look too much into that. It's definitely not the yeah. first war yeah. film, but it was yeah. the first film of this scale to include authentic military yeah. pieces, I would say. And I I think I think it's safe to say it was the first film that depicted war that wasn't just about the glory and heroism of the war that included yeah yeah but well i think we'll get into that a little bit later Ab absolutely um, we will but there's another cool like there's other cool yeah. things that it was the that it kind of broke so, ground on do you want to talk about the yeah the it's shot? really it, it's really cool there's so cool there's, when <laughs> when looking up this film and and watching a bunch of people who went to school all over the country and they've been studying right. cinema for their entire life, there are really two things that spring to mind for them. The first one is what me and Autumn just covered. In the, the military, there are a few scenes where you see people coming out of trenches and it's this big military battle. The other is a much more reserved and quiet and smaller moment. But at yeah. the time, it was so technologically forward yeah. that it that it sort and of broke people's and, yeah, art, uh, artistically, um, you know, biting. ambitious, like it, it, yeah. ambitious is a better word than biting. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, but it is known colloquially as the Paris shot. It is one of the first tracking shots. It's but called the Paris shot because it took place. The scene was in Paris. The scene like was time. in Paris, so you can mm -hmm. see uh, what those blockheads are. They are um, <laughs> actual people, and, and the uh, like. The sort of the black rectangle is the rig, and the rig was hooked up top there to the the ceiling, and it glided in between the people having you know a. a you know, lunch, having yeah, dinner can, and drinks. You and can see on the picture, another... like uh, the lines, you know, what do they call them? The, when you have like the two lines going off into the distance, getting closer and closer, there's a word for that. But oh. you can see like couple after couple after couple at those tables all the mm -hmm. way down to the bottom. And like you said, it just track, it just journeys all the way through them. Yeah. And the scene ends on the very far left corner there, like mm -hmm. the, the leftmost person 
with mm-hmm. uh, a final shot of Jack, Charles, Buddy, Rogers. Uh, but here's what the actual image looked like. Um, so cool. In, in, you know, like in situ, if you will, yeah. um, you can see the camera, so you, you can see the director that's uh, Wellman there on the bottom left corner. Um, but it was incredible. It was an incredibly revolutionary at the time. And <laughs> oh, it was perspective. perspective. Yes. Thank you. Yes. They <laughs> set not up to that. Movie scientists. Yes. Right. Because it was interesting because the way he set it up too, it was not like they're in a perfect line. So you can't see the next people behind them. It was set up. Yeah, like this, so you can see an where angle. you're gonna go next, and it set you up for like, oh, they're gonna keep going. Oh, mm-hmm. they keep going, and it's a really cool effect that I I, I loved. It was I had to go back and watch it a couple times. It was neat. Yeah, it's it's really cool, and it ends with um, again Charles uh, Buddy Rogers drinking. He's on leave after heavily after being he's drinking heavily on leave after being mm-hmm. in a very very harrowing dog Trump? fight. Yeah, uh, and really traumatized by yeah, some and death that occurred that shocked him. And to that point, it's so out of his character. To he he gets drunk and he gets pretty silly. Uh, there's another VFX part that we don't bring up. There's like these bubbles. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> that he's chasing yeah. and he's drunk and he's chasing yeah. the bubbles the entire time and they can't understand what he's doing. But and I, he's hallucinating these bubbles. He's and hallucinating so they, these bubbles because he's drunk. They do this special effect. This um. What did we call Double it? exposure. Double exposure. And they were oh, so bubbled. in love with this effect. They did it over and over and over because the, the scene was, the whole the whole thing of it was that he's hallucinating these bubbles and he's so drunk that he just wants oh, yeah. to catch the bubbles, wants to catch the bubbles. So he keeps seeing them and, like you said, chasing wherever they are. And the scene just goes on and on with more and more bubbles. And it's like, we get it. <laughs> yeah, and it's a very interesting moment. I, I found actually the whole scene of him being drunk and him mm-hmm. chasing these bubbles. Uh, mm-hmm. Clara Bow changes and finds him. There's a whole bit in the it's movie the there thing. that you'll have to watch. I found it to be very, very sad because he oh, is so yeah. traumatized. It is so out of his It was character sad for both of them. He's like... kind of, yeah, because, you know, so Jack is the one that's drunk and mm-hmm. Clara Bow is chasing him because mm-hmm. she finally Who's finds him. in love him. with him. She's yeah. in love with him. And they both completely are, at this moment in the movie, are both completely different people than who we meet them yes. and than when we meet them. And so by the time we yes. get there, you can tell they've lived a lot of life. And that's all we'll say about yeah. that. But it is- um, And it is heartbreaking. Especially when, yeah, it's heartbreaking now that we, in 2024, know the reality of yeah. what war like that did to people. And, yeah. you know, and it was very seldomly talked about in 1920s yeah. after the Great War. I mean, you could imagine, and we barely know about it from World War II. You could imagine right. how hush it was. I think, you know, they, right. they would just call it um, like shell shock was a, a big yeah. part of it. Um, there's, I, I mean, think- I could talk about World War II. Any films, I think, before that, that might have shown, you know, I know that there's films even now where they'll show the, you know, all the soldiers like celebrating in a bar during their leave, but they're not showing them traumatized. They're not showing them reeling from what they went through. It's more of like, let's go to the bar to celebrate. And other people are in that Paris bar celebrating, but it's showing he, and it was, I think it was unusual for the time that they were Mm -hmm. showing the impact that this was having on him. Yeah, this movie uh, it 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 crossed a lot of uh, boundaries, it, yeah. and, and it kind of broke down some walls. There's there's nudity. There's both male and female nudity in this. Yeah, there are. Uh, I you know I saw a, a really insane review, but there was a woman. There's like there's a woman driving. Like that was. <gasps> Can you believe fun. it? <laughs> like, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it was just a, a groundbreaking film at, at yeah. the time that you know you can tell mm-hmm. did quite a bit to yeah. um, impact people. Yeah, um, we and have, it was impacted we have a, by. Yeah, we, we have, have more, a lot more to say on that, but I um, I think that's a good yeah. kind of synopsis of the technology that it brought to yeah. the table. But let's talk a was, little bit about the Oscars themselves because it is interesting them being the first yes. Oscars ever. The first Oscars <laughs> ever in 1929, uh, it, you know, they were held on May 16th coming up mm-hmm. at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Um, they were, it was unlike, you know, today what we have entirely. Yeah. Uh, the first ceremony was relatively uh, intimate. 
you know, all things considered. Yeah. It, there's only 270 guests as opposed to now when it can be, you know, over 800. Um, and the entire event lasted only 15 minutes. <laughs> this show will go long, twice as long. Oh, for as sure. The first for sure. Oscars. Have you ever been to the Hollywood Roosevelt? Um, I I think like years ago, yeah. maybe. It's, it's in downtown Los Angeles. Angeles. It's not a big of a place. It, not a big venue, but it is. I've I've been to it. It's in downtown Los Angeles. It's part of kind of a whole area of historic buildings, yeah. and I that I was checking out. And there's all these great photos from that event all over the walls. There's a whole hallway where they just have photos of the very first wow. Oscars, and it's really really cool to see. It's really cool to see. It's a great That's it's dope. a great uh, stop for a little tour through Hollywood history. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's um, it was an interesting Oscar. I mean, there was, ironically, you know, with the show, we want to explore the films and, and the industry of the Oscars. I mean, it's mm -hmm. in the title, but the first Oscars was relatively benign. I mean, there wasn't that much to it. They were Oscar free. <laughs> uh, they yeah. were um, held. The 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 winners were announced yeah. three months before the. Right. The so ceremony everyone already knew. Was only fifteen minutes and. The Oscars, you know, the categories and what you were nominated for was encapsulated yeah. by two, a two-year body of work because, you know, yeah. the, the Academy started relatively in the middle of the, mm -hmm. you know, in the middle of the 20s. Um, and so they really mm -hmm. started this compilation of trying to admire filmmakers and, and actors and technical writers throughout yeah. the um, – pretty much the entirety of, yeah. of the 20s. It, and it – um, it was more like a dinner party to celebrate the people who won after they already knew they won. So there was just a dinner party to celebrate it. And then they had this, like you said, yep. they had this little quick ceremony of just like spotlighting those people. But it wasn't news. It wasn't a big event in terms of like who's going to win. It was just, hey, we're going to go. So if you didn't win, you probably didn't go. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it would be a lot faster if we did it that way now. I'm just saying. Yep. Let's just wrap it up, Shakespeare. Come on. Yep. <laughs> just announce best picture. Do I'm just Ken? And let's all get let's all get Go. out of here and pair <laughs> now burgers with Paul Giamatti. Um Well, we are gonna get into what I feel is the most important part of what we wanted to mm -hmm. do this entire series mm -hmm. for, which is the societal culture and impact that that you know this movie had and and it was imposed on. Mm -hmm. But before that. We've got one more sponsor. A word from our second sponsor. We've got oh. one more word from our second sponsor. Thank you, Frigidaire. <laughs> that's you. You start. <clears throat> the script, it says you. Oh, yeah, that's my line. It's holiday season. Why not give her a gift that truly keeps on giving? Forget the fleeting sparkle of diamonds or temporary warmth of a fur coat. This year, the ultimate expression of love is waiting at your local Frigidaire dealer. I mean, is it though? Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, Paul, you've got my attention. What could possibly be better than diamonds? Imagine, Autumn, the look of your joy on her face when she unwraps a brand new Frigidaire refrigerator. Yes, the gift of modern convenience right here in her kitchen. Because what woman wouldn't want to spend more time in the heart of her home surrounded by the latest in food preservation technology a refrigerator now that's oh this is a refrigerator now that's thinking outside the jewelry box paul but really a fridge absolutely autumn with a refrigerator with a with, with a refrigerator in the kitchen she'll marvel at how fresh her produce stays how efficiently she can plan meals and let's not forget the sheer delight of chilled desserts on demand it's not just a refrigerator it's a ticket to culinary bliss um, well when you put it like that paul it does sound like a no it doesn't no more ice <laughs> Deliveries or spoiled milk? A Frigidaire could be the start of a chilling love affair with the kitchen. So folks, make your way down to the nearest Frigidaire dealer and bring home the gift that will make this holiday season unforgettable. Because nothing says I love you quite like the gift of convenience. Thanks, Frigidaire. You like that one, Thanks Autumn? Thanks for that. I, I did not. <laughs> That's... I thought that one was fun. 
I can't wait to get a refrigerator instead of diamonds for sure. <laughs> yeah, what person that? doesn't want one of those? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that one was that was a that was one. Mm -hmm, that was an ad. All right, let's move on into the latter third of our show: mm -hmm. the societal culture and impact of wings. The Roaring Twenties were marked by an unprecedented, by unprecedented economic prosperity, cultural dynamism, and technological advancements, epitomized by the Jazz Age and the rise of consumerism. However, this era was also characterized by rampant speculation, income, in, uh, income inequality, and the excesses that ultimately led to the devastating crash of the stock market in 1929, triggering the commercial start of the Great Depression. Um, Autumn, let's get into a little bit of the uh, what we'll call the the real stuff, the meat let's and potatoes. Paint the picture <laughs> of what what the heck was going on around uh -huh. this time. Yeah. Um, so, just a couple of of words to throw out at you all mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. exactly what America was kind of mm -hmm. like uh, during mm -hmm. the twenties. Because yes, this movie represented the you know the Great War, which is from I believe nineteen fourteen to years prior. 1918, yeah. but it really, really is amalgamation the of yeah. this is of the twenties of the Roaring Twenties, as it's mm -hmm. more colloquially known. Um, you know, the United States was going through isolationism with Herbert mm -hmm. Hoover. Uh, mm -hmm. There was prohibition and organized That's crime, right. immigration restrictions, and mm -hmm. cultural and social changes. Some of them positive, like yeah. you know, there, you know, as Hoover, as Herbert Hoover would say, the new woman. Women were becoming yeah, more empowered. The flappers. Yeah. There was also on the other side of that coin, due to prohibition and mm -hmm. lack of police, um, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. It was yeah. an in, who had to police their own neighborhoods. And ultimately, yeah. at the beginning, you know, the Ku Klux Klan later in the 30s and the 40s ended up being a, a horrible institution that mainly targeted uh, black Americans. At the beginning, it really was just this organization that all these people joined to keep up the Protestant cultural ways that, yeah. you know, they felt the, that America the was. purity culture that it needed. Right. Yeah. And all of that on the back of excess. Yeah. Like we've said yeah. so, so, so many times, this was a, the mm -hmm. 20s were a time when uh, the credit culture was built. That's why, you mm -hmm. know, we'd mentioned consumerism and yeah. this this movie it, it doesn't necessarily play like it doesn't show a lot of that you know it doesn't no. really well, showcase isolation uh, isolationism there's no. no organized crime or mm -hmm. nod to prohibition but i can say that the like the new freedom that was happening within a certain privileged class within a certain class of people with the the flappers and the that whole freedom i think is what allowed some of the um messages of this film to be made. There was less constriction to be rah-rah mm. America and rah-rah ra, ra to, you know, heroes and adventure because there was a little more freedom, a little more space happening and yeah. a little more realism. And so I think that that is how the culture impacted this film because it it, it opened the door a little bit. Would, would you say that, because I mean, we'll, as we go throughout this series, Autumn, I mean, it's going to be, you know, once we get into a movie that's 33 and 34, they're relatively in yeah. the same culture. But yeah. this movie being the first picture, it had the either the benefit or the weight, however you yeah. want to look at it, of the entirety of the 20s before. And the entirety of society yeah. led to this movie where... In 1930, right. it'll be like, well, what happened between 1929 and 1930? But this film yeah. is interesting because it takes on the weight of everything else. Yeah. Um, and so do you think that this, like the society at the time in the 20s and 1929, they're on the verge of the stock market crash and uh, mm -hmm. the Great Depression. Do you think that society impacted this film more or was it more impactful on society? I do think that... First of all, I want to say I think the director being as fearless as he was in mm -hmm. how he made the film was also fearless in the fact that he made this kind of film in this time. So like while the society was starting to open up, we weren't fully no. in any way free to discuss all these things and openly discussing these things. But he he stuck his toe in the door and wedged himself in there with a little bit of that. And I do think that 
because this because the culture wasn't fully embracing that kind of realism and real conversations about what was happening i think mm -hmm. that did impact this film because he couldn't go i think as far as he probably wanted to go mm. in terms of depicting the horrors of war because he was there and yeah, he was he trying was to communicate that it's not all about heroes it's not all about noble sacrifice it's horrible there's it's mm -hmm. trauma and he did tell that story a little bit but because of the culture of the time he wasn't able to fully tell that story so he had to soften it up with making heroes and making this romance happen and like i think he, the culture of the time impacted his ability to truly tell the story he wanted to tell he had to soften it up a bit that's my yeah. that's my opinion i think i think that's that's right and i feel that a, a lot of a lot of elements of this film focus a lot on the who you yeah, know yeah. not the incredible rock band We'll get to them eventually in this show, but it it, it was very character focused, and the war was a byproduct of what these characters the, the yeah. time that these characters were in when it really could have gone the other way. When right. um, <clears throat> when you look at something like All Quiet on the Western Front, right. either iteration, which we will be getting to on this show, right? These characters are represented through you know th the war is the character, yeah. And the bi the bi characters mm -hmm. are 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 these people that were entangled with in their stories, and it's I, the opposite. I agree. The film. I it's think this film walked so all quiet could run, and yeah. other films of the future could run. I think mm -hmm. this started the conversation, opened the door a little bit, and yeah. I also think the way that. I do think that this movie impacted the culture in that way, that it did open the door. And, and and I think because it was so successful, it showed Hollywood that people did want to see this kind of story because he could have made that mm -hmm. film and people could have rejected it saying, we're not ready for this. This is depressing and we don't want to see it. But because it was so popular and it won an Oscar, it showed Hollywood that, no, it's time to tell some get a little grittier and tell some more mm -hmm. stories because people do want to see it. And I think it, that is how it impacted culture. Um, it just opened up some conversations. And I think it also impacted culture in that it was probably the first, like it gave veterans of that time a uh, little yeah, bit of platform, um, validation. Sure. Yeah, some validation, some understanding. Um, and it opened the door for people to really start processing what they mm -hmm. really did go through, that they're not just war heroes, that they were, they're traumatized. They're, it was not good. <laughs> And I, I find what's interesting about this film in the context of like best picture Oscar winner is yeah. that it, it really, you know, we we've used this term on other uh, on other fandom social shows, but it's a term that is used all throughout media of, of Oscar bait, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's this technical feat. It's a love story. It's the war, which people can relate to. It's all of these incredibly yeah. relatable things put in front of people at a heightened level. Like that in a nutshell is what like Oscar bait is to people. Um, and some Oscar films, uh, you know, subdue, they, they, they subdue other parts to really emphasize the technical abilities. They it subdue yeah. other parts to really showcase the human stories. And this film was very generic on all fronts. Um, and it, and it's no, I mean, it's to me, it's no wonder why it won and why this mm -hmm. film, you know, I think you had said it best before, you know, when we were, chatting in the pre-show that it set the bar for the rest mm -hmm. of the films that like yeah the other films that uh it was nominated against which is mm -hmm. uh, racket and uh, Se seventh heaven um, was one of them racket, seventh heaven mm -hmm. they are um all probably great films but this film just mm -hmm. did something that no film had done since. And that was like yeah. these aerial scenes and the acting. And there was, it's a, you know, mm -hmm. they're all silent films, but there was just, well, there was just levels to it that were yeah. far reaching enough to every member of the Academy. Well, I think it was interesting because we mentioned Seventh Heaven and it got the most nominations of any, of yeah. any other film there. And so it's interesting that this one didn't win and it did it got more wins like this one didn't win best actor or best actress or best screenplay or what any of those other characters those other um, categories it did win yeah. for technology I don't know what the actual and then award Janet was, Gaynor but... won for best actress. For did Seventh she Heaven. in this? Yeah. Oh, for Seventh Heaven. Yeah. So for seventh, for seventh the other Heaven. films and the other Street films, Angel. The other films took all the other 
awards, but this one just got best picture and one for um, technological, yep. whatever it was. So it makes me think this does feel a little bit like Oscar bait because to me that says they didn't think it was the best acting, the best performance, the best anything, but they decided to give it best picture. And I do think there's a little, because of the storyline, because of yep. the, the subject matter, not the storyline, the subject matter, I think is part of why it won. Mm -hmm. and Regardless of the quality. 80 weeks when we get to it, there's a similar yeah. story with like Parasite, which won yeah. Best Picture, but it wasn't nominated for Best Director. There was no mm -hmm. acting noms, but it was just a movie yeah. that they're like, this is just good. Yeah. Like everything about it is good, but they didn't award the individual, um, you know, uh, members yeah. that made up the movie, the individual disciplines. Yeah. Thank you. So it, it's it's an interesting film and it, it absolutely impacted the culture um, yeah. Or it was it was absolutely impacted by the culture that was around it of excess and and this little of of puritanism. But it did, mm -hmm. as you mentioned very eloquently, it did impact a majority of the culture as well by just yeah. putting the world on notice of like this is what art can do, you know, right. for for you and for anyone yeah. else. Truly, it was a like, small step away from melodrama performances. Yeah, and like. I think they stepped to kind of blander performances for some of them and stereotypical, but it was a step away from these melodramatic storylines for, you know, that kind of was like vaudeville and then these storylines and then this took it a step further is what I, right. one of my thoughts. There were other right. ones around the time that did that as well, but this was, I think, the most successful. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, with, with everything that we've talked about from yeah. this, the, the cultural impact, the mm -hmm. industry impact, and the film in and of mm -hmm. itself. Let me ask you a simple question, Autumn. Yep. Do you think well, this deserved to win Best Picture? I do have a thought on that. But before we get into that, there's one little thing that doesn't really belong in any other part of this discussion that I thought was really <laughs> notable and really interesting. It's a little bit of a spoiler, but not a full spoiler. I'm just going to say that, um, that these two characters, um, Jack and David, do become very bonded through the experience mm. of going through war together. So while they still maintain the rivalry, they are becoming extremely bonded in a way that I think was ahead of its time in film, for sure, mm -hmm. that they have this, they develop this extremely intimate relationship. And I feel that I was shocked at how they portrayed this intimacy between two men. There was definitely yeah. kind of some, I want to say a little homoeroticism tingle yeah. and chemistry between these two that wasn't really explored. I don't think that was the point, mm -hmm. but the point was he, the director really did showcase this intense, um, intimate relationship between these two men. And it was done without any irony. It was done without pulling back. It was done without any judgment. It was just, they've been through it together. And I think that the director understood that this traumatic war experience does bond men together in a way that maybe no other bond could ever compete with. And mm -hmm. it showed or, that bond yeah. on, yeah. And, and I feel like my question, and I don't know the answer to this question because I haven't really done the research, but my question is, was this ahead of its time or was mm -hmm. this what the world was like at that time? Did this concept of men not being able to have that form of intimacy with each other because of, you know, the the patriarchy and because of the need to be manly men and not share their feelings. Did that develop after this movie? Like, did that develop in the mm -hmm. 30s and 40s and 50s and grow to where, you know, it's peaked? Or, or was this just ignoring that and telling a very brave story? I don't know. Like, did it already yeah. exist? You know? Yeah, it's Is a this complicated... ahead of its time or not? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Like just just call up Willie Mae Wellman. Are you yeah. ahead of your time or not? Yeah. Was this indicative of the way men were allowed to have relationships with each other at the time, especially I'm, men who had been through war? I would say no. I would yeah. say it's not indicative of, of how they were allowed to act. I would yeah. say this is such an accurate portrayal of probably how men acted during yeah. the war. Um, yeah. And it was so probably widespread. Um, yeah. And like you mentioned, a lot of these relationships – were so much, much more, more intimate. Yeah. They're so much more intimate than a a wife and a husband yeah. could have in that moment. Because yeah. while there is this level of intimacy, maybe uh you know it, 
obviously sexual or they yeah. have kids or they're, you know, yeah. they have all of these other they societal build a life together yeah. that they're fitting in, you know, that. with, you know, in the scene that we're seeing with, uh, with Jack and David, like um, they are near death. Like yeah. they don't know if they're going to live to be the next right. moment. And sometimes, you know, in, in some books that I've read, they are, you know, majoritively of World War II, granted, are men who, you know, did have like, they're like, oh my God, I love you in a way that is confusing yeah. to me. Right. And some people just wanted a warm body to hold. Yeah. And you, you know, know, I think you're right. Maybe because it wasn't allowed at the time, maybe you're right. I like when you said this is confusing to me because I don't think that men are allowed to have the same kind of relationships with each other that women just do. They just naturally yeah. do. They have soulmates in their best friends. They have people that they have women that they trust implicitly with their entire self and without right. fear of what it might mean. And men aren't mm -hmm. allowed to do that. And I think you're right. I think that men just having that natural intimacy due to trauma bonding really um, might have been confusing for them and upsetting and worrying and like, I don't think that when they go home and they get married and have families that their wives will ever, ever be able to understand what they went through the way yeah. the men that they went into battle with did. And, and so I thought it was really interesting. Is PTSD and the rise in uh, mm -hmm. divorce that we saw mm -hmm. after World War II when it was a little yeah. more acceptable because people just yeah. didn't understand. Um, yeah. <clears throat> again, very, very complex film where you know and all of this subtext is hidden beneath some of the brighter shinier bubble moments and there's yeah this stuff but there is a lot that willie may wellman put in this film that is yeah. right off his own shelf and you can yeah. just um yeah. and so, and, so you know this movie in context of society and you know Basically, the collapse of the um, the economy for three out of four people unemployed. There was uh, destitution. There was excess. It was a very confusing so time. So <laughs> much happened uh -huh. that this film tried to encapsulate. So, Autumn, yeah. I'll ask you okay. again. Do you think this film deserved to win the Oscar for Best Picture over, um, oh, pardon me, Seventh Heaven Seventh and Heaven. The Racket? Right. I watched some of Seventh Heaven. I didn't finish the entire thing. Um, I do think that this, if you're looking at the context of trying to tell, you know, trying to take some risks and to really tell a new kind of story, I, I would say I think it does deserve it for those reasons, for his yeah. fearlessness. Okay. What about I you? Agree. What do you think? I agree. I think this film is just the it is the the biggest film i think it had again um the most risk in it literally unfortunately people yeah. asked for making this film um and you know knowing of the other two films it it is just it is just something you know there's a an old there's an old saying of um of leonard malton and he's talking to uh, you know, members in the Academy when he's, when he does Leonard Maltin's a movie reviewer um, mm -hmm. discussing his films and he's discussing films with these people. And he said, sometimes, you know, you work in the industry, you're a director, you're an actor, you're a grip. And then sometimes a movie comes along and they're like, how the hell did they pull this off? Yeah. And I think that's what was said during wings. And that's why yeah. it won and why I think it deserved to win because so yeah. many people watch this and they're like, how the hell did they do that? Like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, wins. I, mean, I want to know um, if you guys did, if you're watching this oh, and you yeah. did already watch this film, or if you go back and watch it later, mm -hmm. I want you to let us know, what did you think of this movie? Do you agree with our interpretation of it? What other thoughts do you have? But most importantly, what I really want to know, <laughs> like, I'm just curious. If we were going to recast this movie right now and tell this story of that era and do that, who would you cast, modern day actors, who would you cast as these roles? So we let's one more time. It's we've got um, Jack as Charles see. Buddy That's Rogers. Jack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we've got David mm -hmm. as Rich Garland. We've got the character, Garland. the character of Sylvia mm -hmm. and Mary. And then we've got a very cool cameo, really, from Cadet White. 
we didn't even talk about this. Oh my this gosh, like, we didn't even get to talk about Gary Cooper, but you know, we'll we'll talk yeah, about that. He has I a mean, small part that kickstarted his entire career. Like this was yeah. his big break. And I would like to say the official position uh-huh. of fandom social is yeah. Gary Cooper can in fact get it. Get it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and also who would play Schwimp? <laughs> you know who I'm seeing? So, I know, I know yeah. we're gonna let our the audience do this. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing Charlie Day. I want to go Jack Black. Why not? I knew you were going to see that. <laughs> but like I young Jack Black. Yeah. So we've got six roles for you to fill. And we yeah, want to yeah. know who would you cast in those roles? I want to know. Let us know I, in the comments. I've been thinking about this. I cannot wait to be able to talk about this and say yeah. who I would cast because I've already yeah. got them. But um, I want to wait but, until people comment so we're not Oh, yeah. We'll let people comment. Um, so when the video, yeah, comment down below. Um, and everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the thank first episode of the Oscars Almanac History of the Academy Awards. Uh, that was Wings, the 1929 uh, Best Picture winner. The first Best Picture at the first Academy Awards. Mm-hmm. Um, seriously, it means it means the world to us. We, we wanted to do this show in a way that is, um, you know, both representative of of how me and Autumn are, you know, and just yeah. how you guys have gotten to know us in our mm-hmm. cadence, but also a little bit different. It's a little, it's much different yeah. than what we've normally done before. Right. Um, so we want to just continue to push what we can and will be doing. Uh, we've got a lot of really That's fun stuff that we're planning. That is <laughs> a threat. So uh, thanks for joining us again on the first episode of the Oscars Almanac History mm-hmm. of the Academy Awards. Keep an eye out every Tuesday night for a new episode. The next episode will be covering the 1930 Best Picture winner. Uh, it's called the the Hollywood Melody. The, Bro- no, the, the Broadway, Broadway Melody. melody. The yeah. Broadway Melody from 1930. Mm-hmm. And also make sure you join us live every Thursday uh, where mm-hmm. we discuss pop culture news. Sometimes we interview creators. And we also mm-hmm. do deep dive explorations into your favorite fandoms. Um, thank you guys so, so, so yeah, thanks, very guys. much for joining us. Uh, remember to like what you love, love what you like, and don't be a blue nose about it. <laughs> See you next week, everyone. Bye. <laughs> You have just listened to the initial program, their delectable concoction of crazyisms. This program was produced in Hollywood, soon to be shown throughout the country. Next week, another program in the series will be broadcast by this station. Be sure to tune in.